Okay, so this is the second part of week 3. In the last video recording, we've explored specific structures and social spaces, namely the Ruma, the Lumbung, the Masjid, or the Pura or Gereja, uh, then these are the mosque, the temple or the church, as well as the Pasar and the palace or the Istana. And in each of these instances, we see a kind of agglutinative principle underlying its construction and design, allowing additions to be made as buildings are recognized inherently as animated form or a living form serving that radiates from an axial point of the central column. So in this, uh, 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 the second part, we're going to explore the morphology of the urban environment and consider other types of functional zones and structures before telescoping outwards uh, to think about how they exist not only within a natural landscape but also, in some sense, a sacred one. Okay, and what we're trying to try to do is that to think that what is natural or physical is not always separate from what is cosmic or sacred. And that's why we need to sort of like consider what are the relationships between these two spheres. So typically in Southeast Asia, a polity or a system of government is made up of uh, different levels of administration. Uh, in all places of the world, it's also similar. But in this part of the world, the smallest unit here is normally referred to as a kampung. And a kampung here can mean two things. The first is a type of countryside settlement, and typically this is a rural village that is most commonly imagined as, uh, you know, uh, in our common imagination, the Kampo is that rural village, right? But the second meaning of the word survives better uh, when we find it in the English word compound. So in this sense, a kampong can also mean a kind of urban ward or a neighborhood that is located within an urban settlement or a town area. Typically, a cluster of villages make up what is called a mukim, and this is from an Arabic word meaning resident, and then a cluster of mukims make up a daera, which is also an Arab, a word of Arabic origin. Now, these districts then uh, constitute what is called a negara or a nagari. Today, the word nagari tends to refer to the state in our usage, while the negara continues to have the meaning of the word country. But actually, in the past, negara and negri really refers to the same thing. And really, the only difference is in how it was used. So when we use the word negara, uh, uh, it often refers to the state or governmental aspect of a particular country, uh, typically in reference to the state polity. Uh, Interestingly enough, the originally Sanskrit meaning for Nagara uh, tends to refer to the uh, tends to mean city or the city state, uh, right? Uh, but on the other hand, the Nagri refers more to this idea of a land or a country. So in this sense, you wouldn't tell people I'm from Nagara Kedah, uh, bearing in mind that Kedah was an independent sovereign sultanate back then. Uh, to some degree. So you would instead say something like, I belong to Negri Kedah. I come from Negri Kedah. But you would call a, the sovereignty, the sovereign state of Kedah, a Negara. And that's how you sort of like distinguish the difference in, so in, in their usage, uh, as opposed to how it's being used today. Okay. So now typically, an ordinary house or ruma uh, sits on one end of the spectrum, and on the other end of the spectrum is the istana, or the palace. Uh, and this forms the, our imagination of what the Malay world looks like. This is very much reinforced by a common colonial trope, uh, that the kampung on the one side and the court, or the palace on the other side, constitute social spaces and institutions that represent what is authentic or pure in Malay culture. Hopefully, the last video that sh have shown you that uh, this is not the most interesting way to explore uh, our built environment. 
environment around us. Because if we were to do so, we would be forgetting what is really a very important type of settlement within the Malay world. This is a world made up of people coming from all over the world, as well as Malays participating uh, within a kind of cosmopolitan culture made up of seafarers and traders of all kinds, and that is the Banga. If the Malay world is only the kampung or the court, where is this Banda then? The term Banda survives to, in today's usage to mean city, but historically it comes from the Persian word uh, for a port or, or a seaport, right? So those of you who have been to Indonesia might also uh, become be aware that uh, airports there are called banda, bandara, and it's a condensation uh, for the word banda udara uh, or the airport. Therefore, if in the past uh, a city was synonymous with a banda because it was the port that makes trading of goods possible, and therefore cities come into life and is activated uh, when this, uh, as, uh, when you think of an area with a higher concentration of population density, uh, which is what city is, then it is synonymous with the port or the banda because trade uh, makes that happen. So let's look at the contemporary reimagination uh, that we examined in the last lecture. Again, the top image is this fantastical rendering of the palace we have uh, hopefully examined and, and, and deconstruct in the last uh, recording. Now we instead turn to the lower picture that shows a port. And in this instance, this representation also shows a very vibrant kind of Malacca that probably looks like uh, more like a late 19th century Singapore. And part of the reason why we continue to refer to you know, 19th century representation is because they are much more available and also the fact that we have very little idea of what cities were like before then. Uh, so some of the visual evidences did survive and if we were to look at say the print of Palembang in Eastern Sumatra, uh, uh, I think we have to start learning how to sort of read them to make them more useful and productive and meaningful uh, to our contemporary eyes. You would find, actually, by closely studying uh, even Western representations like this, that there's a very different morphology uh, of the city that is being depicted. So notice how in the middle ground of the picture, there's a section of the city uh, with lar a larger concentration of buildings surrounded by uh, what seems like a wall, a rampart, which is like a wall structure built around it for the purpose of defending a particular area. And this is located right next to the river bank, along which we also find other low-lying buildings skirting both sides of the river banks. And there are, these are two features that I like to discuss at length here, uh, which is mainly the skirting of uh, houses along the riverbanks, as well as uh, this walled structure, uh, which is the fort. Okay, So the importance of the fort can be deduced by looking at representation of the Portuguese conquest of Malacca. So as fantastical as the uh, image at the bottom shows, what it uh, does depict is the, the presence of a brick defense structure which keeps the invading Portuguese army at bay. And so significant is the fort that even the Portuguese success, even after the Portuguese successfully had taken over Malacca, the fort was further reinforced as can be seen in the upper image uh, showing a view of Malacca uh, under Portuguese rule. And in fact, the Portuguese retained the existing urban plan uh, uh, that we can deduce is really not dissimilar to the one we saw of Pal Palembang. Uh, firstly, there is that fort structure on one side of the riverbank, and in the Malacca case, it's on the right side, uh, and it's the most visible uh, structure that almost seems like it, uh, it, is, it outsizes everything else around it, right? Next, right next to the uh, riverbank at the mouth of the Malacca River. 
and this, uh, and then what you also see is that the town grows out along the riverbank and fans out from it, suggesting the importance of the river as an artery that organizes movement of goods and people in the city. And this is not unsurprising given that Malacca's ruling dynasty was, uh, came from an exile uh, who crossed the Straits of Malacca from Palembang in the first place. Right. Uh, so a point to note uh, is that the word for, the, for fort in the Malay language is kota. And this survived, uh, this word survived in contemporary usage uh, to mean town. So if today Banda tends to refer to the city, uh, kota is retains the meaning of the word town. Uh, kota then sort of like tends to mean town in today's context. But historically, uh, what it actually refers to is the fort. It is the defense structure serving the purpose of protecting the city. And why this, uh, this, uh, is con this, uh, this term continue is, con is something that, continue that, that we continue to sort of associate with a particular uh, uh, town is because of its uh, prevalence. So in fact, there are plenty of surviving examples pointing to the significance of the structure uh, uh, when we want to sort of like understand uh, whether a place is a site of governance. So typically, in a place where there is a concentration of political activity, the fort is the structure that needs to uh, be there in order to sort of like defend the place from attack from outside, right? And more than the palace, it is the fort because it, it's, a, it's a structure that serves a defensive purpose. Therefore, it's, it tends to be, it tend, uh, in the past, uh, the materials used to construct fort tend to uh, be something that is more solid, and therefore it has survived the test of time, and, uh, and it, it's the evidence of uh, a historical polity that we look out for uh, when, we, uh, when archaeological uh, uh, excavations are conducted in a particular area. Uh, so then, as we think about houses that line the banks of the river, uh, we're moving to our second sort of like point, and that is the houses that line the river, you will have to really think along this week's reading, uh, one of this week's reading, where archaeologist John Nixick classified the pre-modern urban forms in Southeast Asia along two models, namely the heterogeneous uh, or the the, uh, no, the heterogenetic versus the orthogenetic uh, urban form. So. Uh, in the orthogenetic sort of like urban form, it is the city that often uh, exhibits a radial character. Normally, uh, this means that it, uh, it's a city that organizes itself around perhaps a monumental structure. Usually, uh, this structure takes on religious or politi and political significance. Uh, and because of its importance, these structures are, tend to be built with materials that last longer, uh, normally stones, and this, uh, and so it's easier to sort of like identify uh, that a city like this exists at a particular point in time. At a particular point in time, of course, the most well-known example is the Angkor Wat, which we will revisit later in the course. Uh, but here I ask you to imagine, as you look at the picture uh, uh, on the screen, uh, of uh, you know Uncle Ward being patently a, 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 a kind of uh, architectural configuration uh, that is symmetrically sort of like laid out. Now imagine instead of the trees that surround it. Uh, what surrounds uh, this temple are kampong wards that extends beyond what our eyes can see. And that is when you begin to realize the scale of urban development that once uh, was uh, 
part of uh, that once surrounded the temple. Uh, so the orthogenetic city is one particular form of expression. Of course, later on, uh, I'm going to also trouble this reading by introducing recent findings that suggest perhaps uh, we need to think about Angkor Wat differently. But let's let's dwell on this particular uh, example as a way to at least understand Mitzik's uh, argument of, uh, about these two modular forms of uh, urban of Southeast Asia. So the second uh, one, to contrast the orthogenetic city, Mitzik suggests that there's another urban form that is perhaps less visible because it doesn't leave a lot of very visible archaeological remains. Yet they exist, and these are detected in ways towns and urban settlements <coughs> on the one level continue to exist in this form today. And, and mostly these are in perhaps more remote area, uh, such as the Bukit Lawang in North Sumatra. But uh, to find these urban forms back in time, uh, we of course need archaeological proof. Uh, and, and it wasn't until recently where underwater archaeology uh, is, uh, is used as a method that, uh, that it, that we're beginning to sort of like understand that this was actually a part of our historical, uh, that this particular urban form was very much part of uh, uh, the history of Southeast Asia. And with underwater archaeology, what happens is that you, you're dredging up a layer of earth from the river or seabed. And this helps us to discover an entire substratum of material uh, that exists before. And you, by examining these materials, what we find is that they're not usually in the form of large sculptural relics. You know, it's not as if there's a sculpture, you know, buried down in the sea that's going to tell you that Atlantis once uh, existed in this part of the world. But they exist principally as trade wares, tiny little ceramic shards, post pottery shards, uh, coins. Uh, things that were that uh, that might seem very small and as if they are like little bits of uh, uh, insignificant objects that have somehow survived time, survived you know the ravages of time, but collectively they help us to reconstruct a larger picture of trade activity uh, in this part of the world. Uh, especially in cultures where wood is the primary material used in its building and construction. And because wood is perish a perishable material that doesn't last as long as stone buildings, we cannot hope to find them existing, uh, uh, you know, surviving through time in the form that a stone building would uh, survive the test of time. Instead, we have to be creative and look elsewhere. And this, for me, I think is a great lesson in methodology, uh, where, uh, as researchers, we're really sort of pushed to creatively devise a new approach to obtain data. So in order to help us to paint a picture of the past, which then actually challenges a lot of our assumptions about what cities are. Uh, as uh, we use Southeast Asia as an example to participate in a global conversation about the very nature of a city space, right? Now, having said that, if you bother reading Mitzik at all, uh, all the way and carefully, that's not where he stops, you know? You would have come to understand that, in fact, the orthogenetic and the heterogenetic cities are not mutually exclusive models of urban forms. And in fact, many cities were in some ways hybrid of these models. So the clearest expression of this uh, one example is the Ayutthaya, and this is the old capital of Siam, where uh, from this image that you see on the screen, uh, it has a defense wall that surrounds the city. Uh, but at the same time, it's punctuated by excess points, right? Uh, Nevertheless, these excess points are not roads that lead into the city. It's made up of crisscrossing canal system, 
So the picture we get makes the city look more like uh, Venice today. Uh, in this view of Ayutthaya, we are also seeing how monumental religious architecture then becomes a central focus of different neighborhoods uh, and serving the purpose of organizing uh, the various wards around it, as well as the communities that reside in these wards. In this way, we cannot therefore take the European image or model of what a town is supposed to look like and apply it to Southeast Asia. And then discovering that none of the human settlements in this part of the world conforms to that particular model, conclude that cities did not exist in this part of the world. And therefore, what only existed was the court and the kampong. Having mapped out some of the important urban sites that you see uh, up here on the screen, we might want to ask, how do they see themselves and their place in the world? Or the bigger question to ask is, how do cities see themselves within a larger cosmology, as well as in competition and relation to one another? What kind of worldview then structures site and space in Southeast Asia? So this is more speculative, but we might want to, in this instance, turn to O.W. Walter uh, for some ideas. And uh, he is someone you have read in your last week or the first week. And if you continue to read him further uh, at your own pace, you will discover that he, his main thesis is that, his main argument is that there are three shared characteristics that distinguishes Southeast Asia as a cultural unit. And these are, number one, the soul stuff. Uh, what he calls the soul stuff are basically the animating force of a cosmos that consists of realities beyond the one that we are able to sense with our five senses. Another way of describing it is that it is a concentration of spiritual power and that this concentration of spiritual power, uh, uh, often in the Malay world, is called the angin, right? The will or the desire that stirs someone into action. And uh, what the soul stuff is, is a kind of semangat, or in the Polynesian world, it's a mana, or in the Thai context, it is the parang. And a person who appears charismatic or influential therefore is described as possessing a high level of soul stuff or the semangat. Uh, in turn, this person becomes a man of prowess, and that's the second point uh, for O.W. Walters. As a man of prowess, or man who possesses great power, or concentration of power, he, or normally it's a he, uh, but of course this is not gender specific, uh, that person will be able to captivate those around them and turn those around them into followers. In doing so, he assumes a leadership position and therefore acquires social capital out of this leadership role. And this le leadership is visualized often as a mandala, and that's where we have a third point there, uh, with him at the center of power in this mandala concept of power. And when he is at the center, from him, where his charisma radiates outward, uh, in diminishing importance and influence, uh, therefore structures power as one that is more like a concentric sphere of influence. It is circular in nature, as what you see in the image on the screen. Uh, moreover, this mandala or his sphere of influence exists in a galactic system in competition with other mandala or spheres of power. One could say that this, is, this results in a very unstable kind of political landscape where you have different uh, kingdoms and different political leaders fighting with one another. But built into these ideals of a dynamic leadership is one where one's God-ordained charisma is recognized to be innate. Uh, often, 
also coming from the outside rather than something that is passed down within a bloodline. And we will re explore this concept further in uh, a kind of figure that is actually unique to this part of the world. And this is called the stranger king. Rather than some power as seen as something that is inherited from one's family, as something that passes on through the downline, it is, it is uh, something that comes from the outside, something that's external to you as a person or external to the community. So this way of looking at power is that it is inbuilt in this idea, a promise of power being something that is very dynamic, uh, and it is ability to renew oneself through incorporating things uh, and ideas that are external or foreign to oneself in order to introduce a kind of check and balance on the tyranny and weight of the customary or what we think of as something that is endemic to a place. Purity or what is authentic is therefore not something that is always prized in this part of the world. Uh, it is a highlight that the adaptiveness uh, is a key cultural feature, recognizing the chief strength uh, of being able to adapt is the versatility that allows for the transformation of the foreign into something that can be understood in one's own term. And we will explore more of this next week uh, as we consider what is the kind of uh, language of politics that emerges uh, uh, out of this way of thinking about the world and about culture that is not centered on what is pure and what is impure, what is foreign and what is local, but essentially as a space of active translation by looking at some of the key characteristics proposed by Walters in relation to the cosmography of this part of the world and later how uh, we will then look at the most prominent example, uh, uh, which is uh, the use of Sanskrit as a way to participate within a kind of cosmopolis. And what is the view uh, of uh, thinking about uh, Hindu and Buddhist culture if we were to view it from this part of the world?